This is a production of West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by West Virginia University, offering education, health care, and the opportunity to achieve career success since 1867. Information at go.wvu.edu slash forward. Welcome to the Legislature Today, I'm Randy Yoey. This is the eighth day of the 60-day 2024 regular session. Now, West Virginia has been widely touted as an energy state, but it isn't just coal and natural gas anymore. The largest solar facility in the state came online this month in Monongalia County, and Curtis Tate went to take a look. Stretching across rolling hills between two coal-burning power plants, MonPower's Fort Martin Solar Array puts 19 megawatts of electricity into the grid, enough to power thousands of homes. The West Virginia Legislature enabled MonPower and other companies to build projects like this. Delegate Evan Hansen, a Monongalia County Democrat, was one of the bill's lead sponsors. This goes back to a bill that we passed in 2020 to allow our utilities to build solar, a bill I co-sponsored, I'm really proud of, and it took a few years. But it's a real milestone. Coal still generates the vast majority of West Virginia's electricity. But Brian Tierney, CEO of Monpower Parent First Energy, said the sun is another resource the state has in abundance. The resources of West Virginia for years to fuel West Virginia's energy needs. Coal, air, water, human resources, all essential for delivering the lifeblood of our communities which is electricity from the resources of West Virginia. Today we add another one of those resources to that, and that's the sun that shines on this great state. And that's fantastic to add to the mix. Hansen said that transition has finally come to West Virginia, even as lawmakers aim to protect the state's coal generation assets. Yeah, the, the whole world and the country is going through an energy transition right now, and it's it's coming to West Virginia a little bit later than some other places, but it's coming here as well and, and citing West Virginia's large solar array right in between two coal-fired power plants is emblematic, emblematic of that transition. West Virginia workers built the project, according to Natalie Stone, executive director of the North Central Building and Construction Trades Council. We had about 100 workers that worked on the project. There were carpenters, electricians, laborers, operating engineers, all represented by the local unions in the area. Local workers from West Virginia constructed the project. Stone said those workers are ready to build other solar projects and more are coming. There's five total projects in the state of West Virginia that are coming and my council will actually have four of them with our workers that built the project here at Fort Martin. The Fort Martin project took six months to build. Stone said the project wasn't held up by supply chain problems that have delayed other renewable energy facilities. We see delays on that um, with buildings and stuff like that, but no, the solar panels came in actually ahead of time, which allowed the project to move forward ahead, and it, we got it finished ahead of time and on budget, and good win for everyone. Great win for the state of West Virginia. We have a solar project in Mon County, and West Virginia workers build it. What's next? Hansen has been trying to get the legislature to pass a bill to enable community solar. That's where residents and businesses can subscribe to receive solar energy and not have to install panels on their rooftops. The community solar bill will be reintroduced and that could go hand in hand with what the utilities are doing. Community solar is a way for people who don't have a good rooftop to put solar on it to subscribe to a project in order to reduce their electric bills immediately. The next two years are projected to be big ones for solar energy nationwide, and now West Virginia has a piece of it too. For the legislature today, I'm Curtis Tate at the Fort Martin Power Station. Today was Fair Shake Network Day at the Capitol. This statewide grassroots organization is dedicated to getting a fair shake for people with disabilities and clings to the belief that diversity makes communities stronger. Organizations under the Fair Shake Network umbrella filled the Capitol Rotunda, all here with a message and a mission. Together, they hope to further an effective voice in the development of public policy to give people with disabilities a fair shake. 
Network member Charlotte Roth explains that at the grassroots core of the network, it's all about helping the disabled meet basic needs. No, there's no limit, so you know, cause, because, I help. mean, brain, brain, um, TBI, they, yeah, and they get um, IDD, they help with that, they help with people with Down syndrome, they help with people, cerebral palsy, and people like me that, you know, I'm just busted up, and I, that, that, and they help veterans. Fair Shake Network partners are now striving for more than just being assistance organizations. Their mission in 2024 is to better educate policymakers and the public about disability issues and empower people with disabilities to speak for themselves. When it comes to the legislature, the Fair Shake Network offers training on the legislative process. It helps develop leadership, organizational skills, and how to be an effective advocate both at home and here in the Capitol. Network member Sarah Jones says it's not just about bill advancement, but an overall legislative conception of a fair shake across the board. But just being receptive to our, our advocates and, and building that rapport and relationship with us and, and realizing that, that we're visible, you know, having people with disabilities be invisible during this session and uh, moving forward to help their, their decision making. Fair Shake Network members believe that people with disabilities have the right to control their own lives, to make informed choices, to take risks if need be, and live with the outcome of those choices. The House Judiciary Committee debated House Bill 4595 today related to LACRA, the Legislative Oversight Commission on Health and Human Resources Accountability. An amendment presented enhances oversight and transparency by updating LACRA's authority over the state's three new health departments and investigating issues that were otherwise confidential. Delegate Brandon Steele, Republican from Raleigh County, noted that LACRA had no investigative arm to follow through on finding a problematic issue. His past amendment would put investigative teeth in the bill. The bill sponsor, Delegate Heather Tully, Republican from Nicholas County, testified to the importance of transparency in cases involving children at risk, with much of the bill's focus on the Canal County children found last year locked in a barn. I can tell you this bill has been on my mind long, way longer than the Canal County situation. We had Braley Browning in Nicholas County, 2018, uh, died the day after Christmas. Uh, 2018, that happened. 2022 is when this has finally gone through the court system, and our fatality and mortality review teams are also behind. So this case, you know, how to how we learn to address this with uh, the system and the DHHR or the former DHHR. The committee passed the bill as amended. The Senate School Choice Committee received an update on the state's charter schools Wednesday. James Paul is the executive director of the West Virginia Professional Charter School Board. He told the committee that in their second year of operation, charter schools have grown their enrollment by more than 80 percent. But Paul specified that most of that growth has been in the state's two virtual schools. He said a lack of startup funds makes it difficult for brick and mortar charter schools to open in the state. And that's because the, the main funding line item is distributed on a prorated amount throughout the course of the year. Um, so you have to open a school having only received just a very small percentage of your overall funding for, for that year. Paul said funding the Charter School Stimulus Fund, which the legislature passed last year, would be the number one solution to what he called funding parity between the charter schools and the county schools. That fund is currently empty. The stimulus fund would allow the charter school board to administer up to $300,000 in the first two years of new charter schools. Earlier today, Emily Rice sat down with Delegate Amy Summers and Senator Charlie Trump to discuss why the Department of Health and Human Resources was broken up into three separate agencies and how it's going. Thanks, Randy. Today I'm joined by Senator Charles Trump and Delegate Amy Summers, Chair of the House Committee on Health and Human Resources, to discuss the splitting of the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources into three departments. Now this legislation, House Bill 2006, passed last year and was made effective, well will be made effective in May, but three different departments had to be in place by the beginning of this year. So we wanted to catch up with a couple of the legislators who were instrumental in the split to see how it's going. So thank you so much both for joining me, Delegate Summers, Senator Trump. Um, I wanted to get started with uh, Delegate Summers. For any of our viewers or listeners who aren't familiar with the agency formerly known as the DHHR, 
or the Miss Crystal Report. Tell me about the work that you and your colleagues did last year to split the agency. I've been serving for the last 10 years and we have found that the department size has made it very difficult to get to the heart of issues. So we decided to split that department. It's been this way over 30 years into three specific departments that deal with different issues. So Department of Health, Department of Human Services, and Department of Health Facilities. And in those different departments, facilities, the state of West Virginia owns many facilities, psych hospitals, some long-term care facilities, Welch Hospital. That department can deal specifically with those, eight, with those entities that we own and work to improve problems that we're having. You hear a lot of issues at some of the mental, mental um, the psych facilities. And then Department of Health dealing strictly with health issues and human services dealing with a lot of services that our people need uh, to help them do well in life. Yeah. And Senator Trump, you sponsored a version of House Bill 2006 last year um, in the Senate. I wanted to talk about any differences between that bill and the one that passed. And was there anything in that bill that you would have liked to see come to fruition? Well, I'll say this. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, having us, Emily. It's great, great to be here. Uh, Amy explained, excuse me, Delegate Chairman, Chairwoman Summers explained very well uh, the, the reason that it, many legislators uh, in both houses came to the conclusion that it would uh, enhance services to the citizens of the state if we uh, divided what was an enormous, is an enormous uh, agency of state government into component parts. Uh, the, the breadth of its mission as a single entity uh, is it's too much to have uh, cobbled together uh, in one cabinet secretary's position. And so uh, the House bill uh, that we ended up passing uh, was uh, an excellent bill, in my opinion. And uh, I don't think there was anything in the bill that I have worked on that, uh, that we ultimately failed to include. Now, we, we all know as we move forward, we're going to have uh, lots of adjustments to make. Uh, but I think we're off to a good start based on the House bill that uh, Delegate Summers worked so hard on and members of both houses did. And uh, I'm hopeful that over the course and fullness of time, we'll see improvements uh, in the delivery of services to the people of West Virginia as a result of making those changes. And so, Delegate Summers, um, where we are now with the split, obviously we have three separate agencies but is the split going at a pace that you're happy with? Yeah, it's actually effective January 1. Okay. And so, but we allowed in our bill that the House and Senate worked on that reorganization bill together. And so we had just companion bills. So the new secretaries in the bill, we allowed them to become acting secretaries this summer. So July 1, they've been able to get their feet wet and figure out what things they need to do. Now they are, they are secretaries starting January 1. So this is where we dealt with the structure of DHHR, the old DHHR. Our next steps are to get involved in the function of that. And you will start to see bills this session that deal with the function and how things are working. And then in time, when we've established changes to the function, then we will really be able to get to the heart of the budget mm -hmm. of all of these different agencies. Okay. And one of those bills um, actually passed the House today, one of those reorganization bills, the renaming of the DHHR, that's one of yours. Could you tell us a little bit about that? That's really just name changes, yeah. getting all of the names correct in the budget. But the most important bill that we've passed out of my committee so far, let me make sure I tell you the right number, is House Bill 4595. And that deals with changing the Legislative Oversight Commission on Health and Human Resource Accountability, that deals with changing some of the function of that committee. Mm -hmm. It will require um, Department of Human Services to let our commission know within 30 days if there's any serious harm or death to any wards of the state that, um, so we're aware, not through the media, but that we are informed of 
if there's any issues, serious issues. Secondly, it will allow the commission to go into executive session to hear confidential information about ongoing cases. When we heard about cases throughout the state, the response always was, we can't talk about that, it's an ongoing investigation. We're worried that there's no checks and balances on the executive branch. We wanna provide that with the legislative branch to do that. The final part of that bill is dealing with the function. And this is where we're requiring the departments to set up performance measures and goals that they have on all the programs they provide. Until we know what their goals are and what they hope to achieve and the measurable outcomes they have, we can't truly value are they being successful and how much money do we give to these programs and if that's not working, let's utilize those funding for something else that is being successful. Um, so what further measures would either of you take legislatively if the three departments didn't perform up to your standards? Well, it'd be, uh, I will say this, it's going to be up to this legislature, future legislators uh, and governors to, to monitor that, see what's not working, if there are things that aren't working correctly, and adapt at that time. I think, I hope I'm not wrong, but I think by having, divide the agency, into three different parts, each with its own defined sphere and area of uh, authority and, and regulation, uh, that's gonna help. And it's gonna make oversight by the legislature easier uh, and by the governor uh, easier. Now, uh, Emily, I, and I wouldn't, I'm, I don't mean to dodge your question, but we never know what the future is gonna bring. And for instance, the, what has been the DHHR in West Virginia administers the Medicaid program, which is a combined uh, state and federal program to provide health care for citizens of the state, nearly a third of our citizens, I think we're close to a third. You know, those, those programs from the federal level get changes all the time. Uh, so it's, I'm not under any illusion that what we've done is a magic bullet and we we'll never have to look at it again. It's, it's gonna require constant work and oversight uh, you know, having Delegate Summers in the legislature, she's been such an asset because uh, she lives it. I mean, she's, she works in healthcare and has her whole professional life, and having people here who see how it works or doesn't work, where the problems are, uh, has, has been a, you know, great benefit to all of us who serve here with her, and I think will be to the citizens of the state because she has that knowledge and perspective that, you know, many of us do not. Yeah, absolutely. And so we've talked about it a little bit, but what are some of the successes of last year's House Bill 2006? What are some of the ways that it's worked as intended when it was drafted? For me, the way I think it's worked is I have met with all three of the secretaries, the brand new secretaries, and we've met over the last six months. I can see them really excited about focusing in on their issue, not being not being required to worry about so many different things, but not being good at anything, perhaps. So the facilities, like they're, that's all that Secretary Caruso has to worry about. He's really looking deeply into those. Same thing with during the pandemic, our focus was all about health. And so somehow in human services, some of the foster care issues and, and things of that nature got a little less attention because we had to focus so specifically on health. So I think the excitement that they have about really working to improve their departments and find best ways for us to achieve better health in the state has really, really been an asset. What are your concerns? In a recent meeting, you had voiced some concerns, I think it was an interim meeting, about uh, the remaining re bureaucracy and some redundancy possibly in the Office of Shared Administration. Are there, is there still some concern there? Not as much as there was in the beginning. We were worried that the Office of Shared Administration was supposed to sort of decrease bureaucracy, so we weren't repeating communication in every department, um, human resources in every department. But I met with every person that runs, uh, that is in charge of the Office of Shared Administration. Now I am worried they're reporting to three bosses. Each secretary is serving as their, as 
you know, who they have to report yeah. to. I worry how that's going to work. They're reporting that it's working very well right now, that they're able to work with these three new secretaries um, without any issues. But I think it's, I felt reassured when I met with all of them and what their goals were. So I think it's going to be okay. okay. So are you both happy with the um, three new secretaries at the department? Uh, I think so. I think the governor's made good choices there. Uh, you know, one of the things that we do, we've already started to do during a regular legislative session, is field and consider uh, rules, bundles, uh, administrative regulations that come from all the various executive branch uh, agencies and boards and commissions. And I've noticed we started our DHHR this year, and we've got two separate rules bundles now, and we'll, probably, we'll have three ultimately. Right. Uh, and so I think things are on track. I guess, Emily, what I would say is uh, so far so good. I think there, there's a lot more to do, and there are going to be things, you know, when, we, when the legislature undertakes big reform projects, there are always things that pop up that you hadn't thought about, maybe some that we should have, but there'll be some things that we are going to have to address. And uh, I'm confident that, that we will. So do you feel like you've set a good foundation, a good framework for future legislators to kind of stay on top of this issue? I do. Okay. I think so. I hope so. And as Amy's already said, Delegate Summers, I'm sorry, we, you know, we have more we're going to be doing this session. You yeah. know. Even, even such things as going back into the code and changing names to new agency names so that people aren't confused by the law, you know, uh, that those are the sorts of updating things we'll have to do as we move forward in addition to changes and tweaks to the substantive operation of the agencies. What has been some of the biggest uh, successes so far? What's been some good news that you all have heard from the reorganization? For me, it was just that the secretaries were excited about, yeah. about what they're doing and, and the increased focus. I, I would say one of the concerns that we are starting to hear about in the budget process is the Medicaid the Medicaid budget. It's its really growing and um, in need of a lot of money. And I think that's where it gets down to us evaluating the programs. That's going to be the big focus over the next year or two, looking at each program, who does it serve, prioritizing perhaps who we serve in the state. Um, one of the concerns I had was that the people that work, the direct care workers in the, in the waiver programs, um, intellectually and developmentally um, disabled, age and disabled waiver, those workers are needing pay raises. And if we don't have those providers that care for those people, they are people that the state of West Virginia needs to care for. And so I don't want to have to take care for, of these individuals in psychiatric institutions. So I'm very worried about that. We have to find a way to increase the reimbursements to those providers and pay those workers more money. Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much for your time. Thank you for joining me today on the legislature today and uh, for all your hard work. And back to you, Randy. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. And thank you for spending this time with us. Join us next time and every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. for continuing coverage of the 2024 legislative session on the legislature today. And remember, West Virginia Public Broadcasting covers the session daily in our radio news program, West Virginia Morning, and on our news site at wvpublic.org. We also broadcast the daily floor sessions of both the House and Senate on the West Virginia Channel. I'm Randy Yoey. For everyone here at WVPV, thanks for joining us. Have a great evening. Support for the legislature today is provided by 
West Virginia University, offering education, health care, and the opportunity to achieve career success since 1867. Information at go.wvu.edu slash forward. Join West Virginia Public Broadcasting for the nightly coverage of the 2024 legislative session. From in-depth reports to floor debates, committee action, and newsmaker interviews, the legislature today brings you diverse opinions and analysis. Legislators, stakeholders, and advocates all get a seat at the table discussing Mountain State policy and politics. Weeknights at 6 on West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Join West Virginia Public Broadcasting for a special screening of the new docu-series Gospel on Thursday, February 1st at 6 p.m. at West Virginia State University's Davis Fine Arts Center. We will have a special performance by the Martin Luther King Jr. Mill Chorus. There will also be a panel discussion about the rich history of black spirituality through sermon and song. This event is free and open to the public. We hope that you'll join us. <laughs> 